When the great real estate bubble burst in 2008, it triggered the worst recession since the Great Depression. You would think that 10 years after the bubble's peak, that we would have come to some consensus on what caused it and how to prevent another one. But nope, there's still no consensus. People are still arguing after all these years. So I spent a couple of months trying to figure it out for myself and found an easy way to explain the basic economics behind the great real estate bubble. Economists like to say about inflation that prices are determined by how much money is chasing how many goods. The how much money part measures demand and the how many goods part measures supply. It turns out this simple framework also works great for explaining the boom and bust in home prices in the great real estate bubble. So let's get back to basics and look at how much money was chasing how many homes in the great real estate bubble. First, let's look at the second part, how many homes. Homes are the textbook example of what economists call inelastic supply. Most products are kind of like iPhones. If the new iPhone is a hit, great, Apple makes a zillion more iPhones, but they don't increase the price of iPhones. Homes are different. If your town suddenly became super cool and cool people all over the world wanted to move there, home prices in your town would skyrocket. The supply of homes is fixed in the short term, so even small increases in the amount of money chasing homes can cause big increases in home prices. In the long term, in cities where it's easy to build new homes, prices would come back down, but in cities where it isn't, they won't. Now let's go back and look at the first part of that equation, how much money. Two factors determine how much money is chasing homes, how much money people have and how much money people can borrow. And two huge factors that determine how much money people can borrow are interest rates and how loose mortgage companies are with their money or with money. From the early 1990s to the peak of the great real estate bubble, mortgage companies became a hell of a lot looser with their money. They loosened up slowly at first, but then faster and faster and crazier. FHA became looser. Fannie and Freddie became looser. Subprime companies became looser. And in addition, the number of subprime mortgages skyrocketed. Back in the early 1990s, if you couldn't get a prime mortgage, you might not be able to get a mortgage at all. Then some small enterprising mortgage companies started to sell high cost, subprime mortgages to people with iffy credit histories who couldn't get low cost prime mortgages. By the late 1990s, easier mortgages and a strong economy were making a lot more money available to chase homes. Home prices started to rise fast in some cities. For example, the home price index for Los Angeles increased 14% in one year alone, 1998. Then the dot-com bubble burst in 2000. The stock market crashed and a recession began. To pump up the economy, the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates drastically. Interest rates on 30-year fixed rate mortgages fell three percentage points from 2000 to 2003. The lower rates meant people could borrow a lot more money to chase homes if they wanted to anyway. With the same monthly payment, you could borrow nearly 40% more money in 2003 compared to 2000. If you switched to an adjustable rate mortgage, you could borrow 60% more. If you switch to a subprime mortgage, you could borrow even more. Los Angeles, for example, already had a really tight real estate market and its economy wasn't as hard hit as others by the dot-com bubble burst. So the new low interest rates sort of freed prices in LA to rise. Higher prices made people want to buy homes right away before prices increased even more. So prices increased even more. With the rapidly rising home prices, subprime mortgages became more popular because people wanted to borrow more money and more people wanted to borrow. Everyone was talking about home prices. It was as if the dot-com mania simply shifted over to real estate. California real estate speculators were making big bucks. Some took their winnings and moved on to Las Vegas and Phoenix, which triggered bubbles there. I should mention that most U.S. cities did not have real estate bubbles. Home buyers in non-bubble cities could have borrowed a lot more money 
to chase after homes if they wanted to, but they didn't want to. So why not? Most likely they didn't need to. Their real estate markets weren't that tight. Home buyers could find homes they wanted to buy without borrowing more money and bidding up prices. And part of it might be that the people in the non-bubble cities were just less comfortable taking risks than the people in California and Florida. They avoided taking bigger and riskier mortgages even though they could have. Upward price spirals never really got started there. Mortgage interest rates fell throughout 2001 and 2002, so a huge number of people decided to refinance their homes. When they switched into lower interest rate mortgages, many people also got larger mortgages. That way they could get cash out when they refinanced. They ended up with less equity in their homes, but more cash in their pockets. In 2003, an incredible 20% of U.S. homeowners with mortgages refinanced their homes. About half of all mortgages made in 2004, 5, and 6 were refinancing. Home prices had skyrocketed, which meant people could get huge cash outs if they wanted to. They could get even bigger cash outs if they refinanced into low down payment subprime mortgages. Unfortunately, they ended up with less equity, which would come back and bite some people when home prices tanked after the bubble burst. As the refinancing boom was ending in 2003, the subprime mortgage boom really started to take off. And at the same time, subprime mortgages were getting riskier. Credit scores fell, down payments fell, maximum loan amounts rose, fraud rose. Subprime lending standards fell so far that from 2005 to 2007, the median subprime mortgage had zero down payment. And by 2006, half of all mortgages were subprime. Some people chose subprime because they couldn't get prime mortgages. Others chose subprime so they could borrow more money. Either way, the increase in subprime mortgages meant people could borrow a lot more money to chase homes, if they wanted to anyway. Combined with the low interest rates, home prices absolutely skyrocketed in the bubble cities during 2004 and 2005. On top of this, the Fed began slowly increasing interest rates in 2004 but instead of slowing things down, people became even more manic about buying homes right away before the low interest rates were gone forever. Eventually, home prices got so high in the bubble cities that the market psychology changed from, these home prices seem crazy high, but they're increasing crazy fast, so let's buy a home ASAP, to simply, these home prices seem crazy high and they're not increasing crazy fast anymore, so let's just wait and see. The spell was broken. And anyway, pretty much anyone with any inkling to buy a home already had bought one. In 2005, the number of home sales peaked. In 2006, home prices peaked. The spell, however, wasn't broken for the mortgage industry. They continued to lower their lending standards in a desperate attempt to keep the music playing. Many subprime mortgages made in 2005, 6, and 7, especially the no money down mortgages, made it rational for investors to stop paying their mortgages as soon as they realized that home prices weren't increasing anymore. If they put no money down, the only money they had lost was the first few monthly payments they made. The sooner those investors stopped making payments, the smaller their losses. In 2006, after home prices stopped increasing, foreclosures started increasing. By 2007, home prices started to fall and foreclosures of subprime mortgages started to take off. By 2008, foreclosures of prime mortgages started to take off and home prices in bubble cities began to free fall. Then the stock market began to free fall. And then the government stepped in with the first in a series of huge financial interventions. By the time home prices finally bottomed out in 2012, home prices had fallen 30% nationally, 40% in Los Angeles, 50% in Miami, and 60% in Las Vegas. The great real estate bubble triggered the Great Recession, which turned out to be the deepest and longest recession since the Great Depression. Here's why. When the stock market falls, 
it doesn't have a huge impact on the wealth of lower income Americans. They don't own stock. Remember how quickly the economy bounced back from the 50% crash in the stock market in the 2000 dot com bubble? When home prices fall 30%, however, it hurts a lot more people and it wipes out most of what little wealth lower income Americans have. So consumer spending crashes hard. That's why the worst recessions, like the Great Recession, are usually tied to real estate bubbles. I think the Money Chasing Homes framework does a great job of decoding the chaos of the great real estate bubble. It even partially explains why during the bust, we saw home prices fall in cities that didn't even have booms. After the bubble burst, mortgage companies freaked out and tightened lending standards everywhere. The Money Chasing Homes was reduced everywhere, even in cities that didn't have real estate booms. And currently, the Money Chasing Homes framework helps explain why home prices are skyrocketing in Vancouver, the US West Coast, Miami, and some techie cities. It's an influx of foreign and or tech money chasing homes in those cities. The first step to preventing another great recession is to understand what caused the great real estate bubble. I hope this video helped you get a better feel for what happened. If you want more Real Estate Decoded, please subscribe to my website, realestatedecoded.com. And if you're watching on YouTube, please click the subscribe or like button. Your questions and comments are always welcome. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.